This company is being bled like a stuck pig, Mac, and I got a paper trail to prove it. Check this out. Take a look at this. Jesus Christ, Charlie. That right there is the mail. Now, let's talk about the mail. Can we talk about the mail, please, Mac? I'm dying to talk about the mail for you all day, okay? After a year with only the poster, some of us have gone a little crazy. And yet, others out there have managed to bring some connections to light that have really built a strong case for where, what, and who the Shadow of the Earth Tree will be about. These include the content from Zeo Storm, the Tarnish Archaeologist, Agent Jake, Crunchy and Cosmos, specifically their explorations of Mikula and Godwin, and how they connect to the spirit world mentioned by the Health and Steeple. Following all their amazing insight, and with the DLC coming very soon, I've really wanted to go over my own thoughts, specifically where this mysterious location will be. The level of detail in the poster is particularly incredible. So, to explain how these threads could be connected, I've tried to create a cohesive narrative of all the evidences and observations, building an argument for where we'll be going in the DLC. Much of this will be speculative, and obviously, I've been drawing on the ideas from these content creators, especially some of their latest content. I'll link any of the videos mentioned throughout the video, and I'd really recommend viewing them if you haven't already. Although the poster may appear simple, there's multiple layers of meaning to be unravelled. The image of Mikula alone raises a lot of questions. Mikula is the one thing that remains a mystery to me. As possibly the most mysterious character we hear about, there's been a lot of speculation around his role in the lore. This makes his appearance alongside Torrent here very exciting. Although there's still a chance it's a young Marika, with the large amount of cut content around Mikula, and as they're identical to the images we have for him, I think it's Mikula who will be playing a central role in the story. Again, the question I'm most excited about is where the Shadow of the Air Tree will be set. I do think it will be some kind of spirit world, and I've got an extensive idea of why this is the case. This includes how Miyazaki himself has talked about the convoluted nature of the Elden Ring, and how it directly affects the processes of life and structure of reality within the Lands Between. His description of the Elden Ring as a representation of something metaphysical has had me looking at some pretty abstract aspects of the world. So, to help keep this video manageable, I'll first give a rundown for this video. I'll start with analysing the structures of the Elden Ring itself, before going over discussions around the spirit world. Next, I'll detail how these involve Mikula, as well as his alter ego of Centrina. And lastly, I'll end with potential ways we'll access the DLC. I hope this will all be clear, and that, by the end, you'll understand the premise and the weird journey it takes to reach it. So then, to begin making sense of this speculation, we need to break down the two different depictions of the Elden Ring we see in the game. The first is the design in Faramazula, and the second is the version used both in the logo for the game and seen inside Marika and Radigan. Faramazula shows the Elden Ring with many root-like structures emanating downwards, a feature heavily associated with the Crucible. We also see roots weave across the Crucible Night set and radiate from the black and white orbs of the Crucible Hornshield. This use of roots, and its location within the crumbling Faramazula, tells us the rooted Elden Ring likely came from the age before Marika's. Her Age of the Earth Tree began with the war against the giants, followed by the brief Age of Abundance. Let a new epoch begin, an epoch glistening with life. Brandish the Elden Ring for the Age of the Earth Tree. We aren't told much about this early period, only that warmth and blessings fell from the Earth Tree like rain. The Blessed Dew Talisman states, It was once thought the Blessed Sap of the Air Tree would drip from its boughs forever, but that Age of Plenty swiftly came to a close, and with time, the Air Tree became more an object of faith. The same sap is found within the Amber Medallions, making them the most precious jewels in the Age of Godfrey. A primordial life energy is said to still reside inside them, as well as within the red-tinted primordial gold of Godfrey's Crucible Knights. This era of the Earth Tree is also associated with the ancient Earth Tree incantations, which include the aspects of the Crucible and healing incantations that tell us how the Earth Tree once flourished with abundance, yet it was only for a fleeting moment. Such is the course of all life. While the primordial energy of the Crucible was still present within the Earth Tree, we aren't told when this age of abundance ended. However, we can explore this area further by looking into the different sigils used for Earth Tree incantations. It's been argued they depict the progression of Marika's Erdry society, which was thoroughly detailed by the tarnished archaeologist in his video on the Three Creeds of the Erdry. To summarise the argument, the three sigils began with the ancient Erdry, followed by Erdry worship and then Golden Order Fundamentalism. 
The more wild and natural design of the first sigil seems to reference the Crucible and the Age of Abundance. This motif is emphasised further within the sigil for the Omen Shackles, showing the same central structure wildly overgrown with the roots of the Crucible. This era is mentioned again within the Hero's Rune. There were once heroes who walked the battlefields, abundantly blessed by the Urtree itself, who upon earning their honour simply died. Notably, the heroes simply dying would fall way outside of rebirth through the Urtree. We know this system began with the removal of destined death, and we know this event was the beginning of Marika's Golden Order. The Black Blade incantation, learned from the remembrance of Malaketh, again uses the ancient Urtree sigil. To me, it seems the Black Blade was the last ancient Urtree incantation, suggesting the removal of destined death is what changed society towards Urtree worship. This would mean the Age of Abundance is actually synonymous with the use of this sigil, and that both ended when recycling souls through the Urtree was initiated. Personally, I've always thought the Crucible's primordial energy within the Urtree was the cause of the Age of Abundance. As the Crucible is heavily associated with its many roots, I think the contemporary form of the Elden Ring was only fully formed after the removal of Destined Death. In some way, I believe this stemmed the flow of bounties from the Urtree, and the age that followed would be that of Urtree worship. This would explain the second sigil, a refined Celtic design without any leaves, reflecting the decline of the Urtree's bounties as it became more an object of faith. This is just a brief rundown, but I think it's important to view this design as the Elden Ring before Destined Death was sealed. So then, looking now at the contemporary Elden Ring, there's only a single vertical element remaining. This central column now reflects the straight trunk of the Urtree, instead of the Crucible's roots. Additionally, concentric arcs now emanate downwards throughout it, with the largest at the bottom mentioned within the Rune Arc. The lower arc of the Elden Ring is held to be the basin in which its blessings pool. While the rooted Elden Ring represented the primordial blending of life, Marikas represents the containment of souls within the lands between, recirculating again and again through the Ur Tree. As such, I believe having Blessings Pool within the Basin Rune is an important part of this system of everlasting life. So, I hadn't noticed this description before Crunchy mentioned it in his video on the structure of reality. I luckily had the chance to discuss this with him in a conversation he's released on his channel. Getting to ask him about some of his conclusions was an amazing opportunity. I would recommend checking the conversation out, as he has both an amazing insight into the lore and a great understanding of FromSoft as a company. He's also the first person I've seen discussing the Helfen, which is now a common topic in discussions around the DLC. Specifically, within the description of the Helfen steeple, it has a mysterious mention of the spirit world. Great sword patterned after the black steeple of the Helfen the lampwood which guides the dead of the spirit world. The lamplight is similar to grace in appearance, only it is said it can only be seen by those who met their death in battle. So this implies the Helfen is an actual location, and is the only mention of the spirit world within the entire game. The skill of the Helfen steeple also coats the blade in ghost flame. In the age before Marikas, this flame was used in the ancient rites of the deathbirds, cremating the dead instead of burying them. This practice would be abandoned though, and souls began recirculating through the Urtree by Marika's design. As I've speculated, I believe this system originated from the removal of Destined Death, so the ghost flame used by the Helfen Steeple identifies it as a relic from this previous age. Priests of the Deathbirds wielded the Death Ritual Spear, featuring many offset branches along its design, also present in the red and blue feathered branch sword talismans. A talisman adorned with red or blue feathers, once used in ancient death rituals. The heart sings when one draws close to death, and a glorious end awaits those who cling so tenaciously to life. This suggests an important relationship between life and death, particularly the delicate line in between. The fear and acknowledgement of death itself might actually be what gives life a more complete meaning, or in other words, fighting to your fullest extent is what it means to be truly alive. Just as Gwyn was desperate to hold on to his Age of Fire, just as Marika was desperate to make her family live forever, both are a fable of the dangerous effects of stagnation. FromSoft has tried to put across the importance of growth and adaptability throughout their games, through both the lore and gameplay. If love leads to fear, or pride, or desperation, or if you cling to something too tightly, it will either suffocate, or it will break. So, just as the rooted Elden Ring represents the blending of life, 
including death and souls transitioning to the spirit world, I think Marika's Elden Ring also reflects her desire for everlasting life. Again, her system retains souls within the Lands Between, no longer being guided to the spirit world mentioned in the Helfen. As such, I believe the lower arc of the Elden Ring, the basin rune where the blessings pool, is actually a barrier placed by Marika that separates us from the spirit world. Looking at the downward motion of the Elden Ring, it naturally caps off the flow of life, and as the place where souls pull together, they are then reabsorbed through its central column, through the Earth Tree, and somehow are reborn into the world. This is very different to the rooted Elden Ring, with roots trailing off in many different directions. Some of these might be towards the Helfen, with souls guided by its lamplight, while others depart in different directions. Marika's system opposes this natural progression of life, and souls can no longer progress from this area of the Elden Ring. And the Basin Rune appears within Marika's own sigil, indicating it is a key component for her order. So, if the Basin Rune was added to prevent souls from leaving the Lands Between, then sealing the Rune of Death would also ensure that no souls could truly die and move onwards. The name Malaketh means Death of the Demigods, and it is said that there was not one demigod who did not fear him. Champions knew what was at stake. Indeed, that's what made them champions. Wielding Destined Death, he alone could kill souls in the Lands Between. This, I think, meant he was able to send them to the spirit world, therefore outside of Marika's order of Erdtree Burial. The Rune of Death also has an arc, but in the opposite direction to the Basin Rune. Crunchier suggested, if the Basin Rune stops life from flowing out of the Lands Between, then maybe this opposite arc of Destined Death could represent stopping life throwing backwards from the spirit world. To make sense of this, and to clearly show the spirit world being separated by Marika, I've been using this graphic with a simple inverted Elden Ring to represent a continuation beyond the Basin Rune. It also clearly shows how souls have been sealed within one plane of existence, with Destined Death being the only possible gateway, the only method for souls to move to the spirit world. Using this imagery can help demonstrate how the half-death of Godwin would cause a catastrophic flaw in this system. We know the fragment of Destined Death that Rani stole was used on her and Godwin. She secretly had it used on both of them simultaneously, which split the full curse mark in two. So, while Rani had only her body die, freeing her soul from her Empyrean flesh, Godwin died in soul alone. Oh, Lord Godwin. Oh, my poor sweet lordling should have died a true death. A scion of the Golden Bough, sentenced to live in death. How could such a thing come to be? <sighs> Godwin now lingers as a soulless husk, and his body was buried in the deep root depths, from which Deathroot began to spread throughout the lands between. On the night of the dire plot, the stolen rune of death enabled the first death of a demigod. Later, the rune of death spread across the lands between through the underground roots of the Great Tree sprouting in the form of Deathroot. This is the description for Deathroot, and is the source of those who live in death. When a soul comes into contact with Deathroot, their bodies are reanimated. Do you know of those who live in death? The very notion of life in death defies the Golden Order. They are described as trespassing beyond life's bounds, their souls refusing the Erdtree's call, continuing to live in death instead of being reborn and as such, they are hunted by the Golden Order Fundamentalists. Those who live in death fall outside the principles of the Golden Order. Their mere existence sullies the guidance of gold, tainting its truth. So, they are the greatest enemy to Marika's Order, and this would make perfect sense if Deathroot comes from a source outside of her design. But how could this be the case? Well, if Godwin was the first to die in soul alone, then he's the first to have his soul and body separated across both the lands between and the spirit world. Because of this, I believe this means his body is now acting as a bridge, as a hole punched through reality and into the spirit world. Such a wound, such a flaw in Marika's barrier, could have allowed Deathroot to erupt in the lands between from the spirit world itself. Burying Godwin's body in the deep root depths would likely have made things much worse, spreading the death root further and faster. 
Now, this may sound like a stretch, but there's another very interesting detail with Fia's mending rune of the Death Prince. When added to the Elden Ring, it's actually placed directly over the Basin Rune, right across Marika's boundary between worlds. Its description reiterates, the Golden Order was created by confining destined death. Thus, this new order will be one of Death Restored. We don't know what an Order of Death Restored would look like, but as Fia's Rune places half of the curse mark on either side of the Basin Rune, I believe the plan is to expand the rupture between worlds even further. This would certainly create more of those who live in death, while completely ending Marika's cycle of rebirth. These souls have committed no offence. They have every right to life, only they happen to touch upon a flaw in the Order. Those who live in death simply happened across this hole between realities, making them abhorrent in the eyes of fundamentalists. They all come from a flaw, a mistake within Marika's Golden Order, created by the half-death of Godwin. Alongside the spirit world, Crunchy's gone to great lengths exploring how themes of water are heavily associated with those who live in death. The mariners themselves are especially confusing, as a spirit sailing skeleton seems pretty out of place to me, as well as particularly non-threatening. The themes of water and spirits are also connected through the spirit jellyfish, and Godwin's soulless bodies transformed into a mermaid for some reason. But, if the space between ours and the spirit world were this place of water, having it leak out of the hole where his soul used to be might explain this hideous transformation. And why the mariners, who can call forth those who live in death, arrive in the lands between on their spooky boats. There's also a few separate realities we're taken to. Rani's ending, Rinala's boss fight, and the final boss fight with the Elden Beast all take place on a plane of shallow water. I believe these will strengthen Crunchy's arguments for water being an associated quality of the liminal spaces between realities. As such, the area beyond Marika's Basin Rune might be considered such a realm. So then, going back to the Shadow of the Erdtree poster, this is where I believe the DLC will be taking place. Somewhere beyond Marika's Basin Rune around the Lands Between, I think we'll be reaching the Spirit World, long since separated after Death and Death was sealed. Now, if this is the location of the Shadow of the Air Tree, how would any of this relate to Mikola? Well, to start with, we know he abandoned fundamentalism to create the Halig Tree, beginning his own order of unalloyed gold outside of the purview of Marika's Air Tree. Interestingly, Zaya Storm pointed out in one of his recent videos, the tree is actually formed from two separate trunks, spiralling together in the form of a helix. He's also highlighted how the double helix design is heavily associated with the gods of Elden Ring. The Godslayer Greatsword, the Sacred Relic Sword, the Finger Slayer Blade, and Placidusax's remaining two heads all feature a double helix, with the Oracle Envoys said to sound their twisting horn to herald the arrival of a new god or a new age. We can even see the double helix within the rooted Elden Ring center, contrasting with the straight trunk of the Earth Tree. Obviously, the helix is also a core component of Mikola's own iconography. It's found within Mikola's needle, Melania's armour, the armour of the Halig Tree, and the very sigil for the Halig Tree itself. But why would the helix be so significant to Mikola? Well, if the Halig Tree was to be Mikola's successor to the Earth Tree, it's likely he wanted to avoid the same flaws from Marika's order. And I think the helical nature of the Halig Tree is a clue to how he wanted to achieve this. As mentioned, only one of the spiralling trunks has grown properly, the other just a withered husk. It's clear something has gone wrong here, and while one half may have simply been stunted by Melania's scarlet rot, I believe there's more going on under the surface. We know the double helix is significant to the gods, with Mikola's needle able to ward away the meddling of outer gods. As such, a double helix halig tree might have been an opportunity for Mikola to help cure his sister's scarlet rot. Interestingly, its successful half shares a symmetry with one particular minor earth tree on the Atlas Plateau. Located within the minor earth tree church, it's much smaller than the other 11 on the map, but it also spirals to form a single helix. For what this means, I think both of these are demonstrating that something is missing for the second helix to grow. If this is true, then there might be a specific reason why the second helix of the helix tree couldn't form. This might be some sort of missing component within it, or maybe it might be something that's missing from the lands between itself. For this particular minor earth tree, and this section is just some wild speculation here, 
I think there's a possibility it was planted by Mikla himself, maybe as an early attempt to grow his Halic tree. Maybe he also abandoned fundamentalism here after concluding the double helix is a more complete form than the straight line of the Golden Order. As such, and after this minor earth tree only grew with one spiral, he began watering the helix tree with his own blood to try and create a more complete earth tree. There's no way to back up this claim, and I'm certainly not suggesting this would be exactly how it went down, so if anyone has any other ideas exploring Mikola and the double helix, it would be a great help if you could let me know down below. I will say that the double helix is significant though. Such a structure is referenced within the cross tree great shield, emblazoned with an old interleaving tree, which suggests the design of the helix tree has a deeper meaning in antiquity. A double helix helix tree would also be very similar to the world tree seen in Berserk, also known as the World Twin Tree, Spiral World Tree, or the Great Helix Tree, it appeared when its branches were connected to all the layered realities at once through a fissure created by Femto. Resulting in Fantasia, the physical and astral worlds were freely connected, and the city of Falconia at the tree's base became the last safe haven for humanity. Obviously, this would have a clear parallel to Mikola's Helix Tree and Elphael and Zeostorm has a video detailing the ways the ruler of Falconia, Griffith, seems to have heavily inspired Mikola's character. So again, an Erd tree with the shape of a double helix, the intended form of the helix tree, might be the key for Mikola to change fate and cure Melania's scarlet rot. And again, we also see the double helix through the centre of the rooted Elden Ring, from the time when people could still die a true death. As such, I think it's possible the missing element for the Halig Tree's second spiral was lost when Marika created her Basin Rune. This would mean it was sealed away within the spirit world long ago. I believe this would provide great motivation for Mikola travelling there, on a quest to complete his Halig Tree for his sister. Whatever form this missing something might take, whether it's something actually physical or even tangible, I believe he embedded himself within the Halig Tree in order to enter the spirit world. As for how Mikola could traverse through Marika's barrier, here is where Centrina comes into the picture, the mysterious goddess of dreams. Some say she is a comely young girl, others are sure he is a boy. The only certainty is that their appearance was as sudden as their disappearance. Centrina is hardly explored in the game. Although there was, of course, a lot of cut content that was based around her. Rico's Dream Brew questline, for example, involves his search for Centrina's, no, Lord Mikola's cadaver. Before Rico, Dream Mist was part of a questline with Carle. Here, he would mention a mysterious figure who sang to the merchants entombed below Laindel, calming the frenzied flame inside them. Our song derives from an old lullaby, sung for us. Long ago, deep inside our tomb, but whoever it was sings no longer. Its melody allowed us to sleep, despite the cursed flame. These would have confirmed that Mikola is Centrina, and that they could visit people through their dreams. But as said, sleep was sadly very underexplored in the base game. That said, there's still something quite notable. Many of the references to sleep seem to describe it as sort of analogous with death. Fear sends us to fight Fortisax inside Godwin's deathbed dream, implying his soulless body is still dreaming. When Roger is succumbing to Deathblight, he feels like he's falling into a deep sleep. Lately, I feel I'm on the precipice of falling into a deep, fathomless slumber. And Rani also mentions entering a slumber, during which it seems she's no longer present within her dull form. I shall soon enter my slumber, and it will be some time before I wake. The other soulless demigods are said to slumber inside the wandering mausoleums, and for Anala's sweetings, rebirth is as sleep to them. So, in some way, particularly highlighted by Fia and Roger, there's definitely a strong connection between sleep and death. As such, it's made me suspect that sleep might also have a connection with the spirit world, if so, then it's possible Mikola cocooned himself inside the Halig Tree specifically to enter a deep slumber. Doing so would allow him to traverse the boundary between life and death through dreaming, the persona of Centrina created in the process. Mikola could be searching for this missing component to the Halig Tree, or alternatively, he could be searching for Godwin's soul in the spirit world. 
his soulless corpse is the source of Deathroot, so bringing his soul back might mend the hole between realities. In either case, a deep slumber would be his method of entering the spirit world. However, we know that Centrina vanished soon after they first appeared, which I believe was due to Moog stealing Mikula from his cocoon. We can find it inside Moguin Palace, where he's grown remarkably from his infant stature. From his change in appearance and his unresponsiveness, it's clear something is wrong though. But what could this actually mean for Mikula? Well, the Fervor's cookbooks were left by a man who was utterly captivated by Centrina. He continued to search for her in his slumber. So, Centrina might still be found in the world of dreams. Using this perspective, if sleep and dreaming is like a sort of death that links it to the spirit world, that could be where Mikola's soul is. If he purposefully entered a death-like slumber to traverse through the spirit world, his connection to his body would have been broken, leaving him stranded there. He is roaming the spirit world with Torrent, having lost his connection back to his body in the Lands Between, and this is exactly where I believe we'll find him in the DLC. Attempting to correct the flaws within Marika's order, searching for the essence needed for his Halig Tree, and creating for us a new mending rune and a new ending for the game. As an aside, Torrent being in the poster could strengthen this idea. As a spectral steed, Torrent can appear to our position whenever called. Just as spirit ashes can be called by ringing the spirit calling bell, and like the wandering mausoleums, ringing their bells to summon the headless spectral knights, using the spectral steed whistle to call Torrent aligns him with the other methods of calling spirits. The name Torrent means a strong stream, another reference to water, and so, as he is a spectral steed, he may actually be jumping between the lands between and the spirit world as he pleases. If he is jumping from the spirit world, his name would be a direct reference to quickly traversing through the liminal space of water between realities. Torrent exploring the world with Mikula would certainly make him his former master. This has long been speculated, as the spectral steed whistle itself is made of delicate gold work, similar to his other creations. We're given this whistle by Melina, who is also bodiless. As she materialises in a similar manner, she might be freely traversing between worlds as well. So then, this would explain how they both could accompany us within the DLC, potentially leading to more interesting events and dialogue with Melina. Lastly for the poster, we have the two trees fighting in the background. The light one has the same straight trunk as the earth tree, and it's being choked by what looks like Deathroot. I'm not sure exactly what they might be, but they are forming another helix design. They might be housing the something Mikula needs for his helix tree. Something else I've been wondering though, if the hole in reality allows Deathroot through, would this also be happening in the opposite direction? Something from the Lands Between could be entering the spirit world, and, as Godwin was buried at the roots of the Ur tree, something from the Ur tree itself could be spreading on the other side. If so, could the Light Tree here be part of the Ur tree? I'm not entirely convinced myself about this, so as an alternative suggestion, there's a chance the Light Tree could be, in some way, Godwin himself. His soul could still be fighting to protect the Lands Between, defending the whole and realities from something within the spirit world. So, we might actually meet Godwin in the DLC, or at least learn a lot more about his story here. This could also mean there's a sinister entity that's the source of all the Deathroot. The last big question I want to speculate on is how exactly we'll be accessing the DLC. Following the perspective of this video, Mikula and Godwin would be the strongest link between realms. If we're following Mikula through some sort of deep sleep, then his cocoon in Mogwin Palace would be an obvious entrance point. If he continues his slumber within the cocoon, all would be well. There's also Riku's cut Dream Brew quest line, with the dialogue suggesting he would have progressed all the way to Mikola's cadaver. So maybe, if Dream Brew is restored for the DLC, he might prepare for us another draft, strong enough to enter the spirit world through deep slumber. Alternatively, as Godwin's soulless course would be the hole beyond Marika's barrier, then we might directly traverse this bridge between realities. In this case, we would enter through Godwin's corpse here, although there's a fair chunk of content taking place in this area already, so more might be overkill. That said, this would make it hard to miss, especially if we're already here for other questlines. Fia does sit next to Godwin, and even sends us into his deathbed dream here, so she might also send us into the spirit world in a similar way. 
Instead of these, there may be a physical location where we can travel between realities. The mountaintops of the giants is an obvious choice, as it already has spectral trees and fauna, and the deathbirds can appear here at any time of day. There's also the red grace of the Forbidden Lands, which has been speculated to potentially be the Helfen's lamplight. The gem within the Helfen steeple is a similar hue, and there's another red gem within the rolled medallion, further suggesting this link. As tarnished, we might be able to see this lamplight, having previously died before entering the Lands Between, so the Helfen might be physically or spiritually closest to the mountaintops. As an interesting aside, there's also the Stargazer Ruins, where we reunite the two spirit jellyfish. Sister, where did you go? You promised me when we turned 14, we go to see the stars. I've been waiting ever so long, forever and ever it seems. <sighs> Dear sister, you finally here. No time to waste. Let's see the stars. The two graves here suggest they were both originally humans, and their dialogue about seeing the stars has made me wonder, could the spirit world itself be above the lands between, maybe amongst the stars? We learn from the Sword of Night and Flame that astrologers, who preceded the sorcerers, established themselves in the mountaintops that nearly touched the sky. And we know from the telescope that the fate once writ in the night skies had been fettered by the Golden Order. So, if the spirit world is within the stars, this could be a reference to Marika separating it off when Destined Death was sealed and the Golden Order was created. In any case, some form of passage may be opened up for us somewhere on the mountaintops, or maybe the consecrated snowfields. These would be very late game, but as progression becomes pretty linear at this point, it would be a good avenue to explore before completing the game. On the complete other side though, there's some interesting details about the island below Castle Morn, the southernmost point of the Lands Between, and where we fight the red-haired Lionel Misbegotten. With the spirit world connected to the Lands Between through a liminal space of water, there's a chance we may simply traverse the Sea of Fog from this island. Very notably, the largest grave is leaning against the withered tree, which I think definitely could be considered yet another double helix tree. So, if the liminal space of water is the literal sea around the lands between, we may find a boat landing here, ready to take us to the spirit world. Similarly, there is the huge island to the northwest of the helix tree. I've never seen anyone mention this, and it's interesting to me that the island is actually modelled pretty fully. Incidentally, on this particular platform of the Halig Tree, with a very clear view of this island, we find the Halig Tree Soldier's Ashes. These are the ones that explode with light before dying. May the flash of our deaths guide Mikola's return. If their flash was to guide Mikola home, maybe they were trying to signal Mikola from this platform. So then, there's a chance we could simply sail over, with the map continuing further to the north of the Lands Between. There's land visible over the water in other places, like the western coast of Leonia. Sadly though, these seem to be a part of the skybox, so we can't take a closer look. But a letter or invitation from Mikola, granting us passage to sail across the Sea of Fog, would be pretty exciting, I think. And lastly, if anything, there's a chance we'll be using a special item to enter the DLC. I'm not sure where we'd get it, or who would give it to us, but using an item would make quickly transitioning between the spirit world and the lands between pretty law friendly. While an invitation from Mikola would be pretty cool, if I'm being honest, I'm still not sure exactly why we'll be searching for him in the spirit world. I've been too excited to talk about its location to try and speculate on much else really, and I'm sure there'll be new NPCs, new quests, and new details that will change everything around for the lore. So, this just about covers all my thoughts on the Shadow of the Earth Tree. So I'll end this with one last interesting detail within Garank's very last line of dialogue. Tarnished. My thanks for thy long labour. But I have done all I can in this land. Henceforth, mine appetite shall be my sole companion. Farewell. All that can be done in this land. And, once again, we see Garank fade away in the same manner as Torrent, Melania and Rani. 
Garank remaining even after we've defeated Malekes is a tricky detail, but with this in mind, it would be cool if this dialogue means he's travelling to the spirit world, continuing his pursuit of death and death root there. As the holder of death and death, it's possible he'd have the power to go there, maybe even using it on himself, although this could be a one-way trip. Either way, it would be amazing to find him again in the DLC. This is all just speculation, but I think the sentiment of fighting for life, or living a life that is conscious of death, could be the important essence lost with the system of Erdtree Burial. Ritual combat, after all, was a part of life at the beginning of Godfrey's rule, but died out by the time of fundamentalism. This essence to life, I think, could end up being something tangible in the DLC, and could possibly be what Mikola wanted to find in the spirit world. As such, I think he'll likely still be pursuing this during the Shadow of the Earth Tree. At the very least, I believe the line between a true life and a true death will be a strong theme for the DLC. More likely for Mikola, this sentiment was lost with the sealment of Destined Death. But, as it's now been unbound, maybe this essence could be brought back. Or, maybe Mikola can find something that's the best of both worlds. So with that, I want to thank anyone who's made it this far. This topic is where my mind's been at for the Shadow of the Earth Tree, and there's a good chance it's become pretty unhinged. So I really hope this has all made sense, and if you have any thoughts on where your mind's been at this year, or any thoughts about anything in this video, I would love it if you could leave it in a comment down below. I've got a little update for my channel, so if you're heading out now, really thanks again for watching. I hope this wasn't a rambling mess for anyone, as I end up writing these without explaining everything to its fullest detail. I kind of have the feeling you guys are always well versed in the lore, especially all the particular items and sources I talk about. There's a tricky balance between these things being too long or too rushed, and they always end up being longer than I'd hope. So, if anyone gets this far, and you're thinking you'd prefer if I took the time to explain all the item descriptions and references I'm pulling from, then I'd love it if you could let me know as well. With all the hype around the potential date for the DLC, I had to shelve my planned video on the mysteries of Radigan for the time being. I've been wanting to make shorter videos, but the Radigan script has somehow reached 20,000 words, which was longer than my dissertation. So I'd like to ask if you guys would enjoy longer or shorter videos, or maybe even both together. It would be a huge help, as I want to make the content that you all enjoy watching. I'll still be taking the same level of care to make sure they're the best I can, so no promises I'll be uploading more frequently, but any ideas you'd like to see explored would be great too, and would give me ideas for some shorter videos alongside the longer ones. I've said it before, but getting to talk and explore the lore with you guys is really why I want to keep making these. Even if you disagree with all of it, or if there's even just a few ideas that you're interested in, please don't hesitate to share your thoughts. The DLC is just around the corner, and I can't wait to hear all the ideas it will bring to the community, even if we end up with more questions than answers. So then, with that said, I'll end by mentioning all the amazing content creators that have been incredible influences for me. These guys have helped me enjoy the lore so much, so a huge thank you to Zuli the Witch, Crunchy the Tarnished Archaeologist, Zeo Storm, Smoke Town, Sekiro Doobie, Asian Jane, Cosmos, Quayla, Garrulous Goldmask, Vartividia, and Last Protagonist. Again, thanks for the hours of amazing content, and for all the hours and hours that you've spent making them. With that, I hope you're all good guys, don't you dare go hollow, and I'll catch you all in the comments. Cheers.